Hello. Hello. Hello, John. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Uh, Melissa. Are all panelists here yet? Uh, I yep. call Joe now. So we are just missing one, right? Yep. yep. Okay, good. I think Joe is here now. Hello. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. It shouldn't be a problem, right? You can see me properly, right? Uh, can we all see all the panelists? Yes, uh, panel one, panelist one is... Uh, Good, I think we are. Uh, how about Chad? Is he here? I haven't seen him, but I also just messaged him as well as uh, his team. So I asked him to join as soon as he's available. Okay, so he won't join us now. He will be joining us later, right? Yeah, I, ideally I told him if he can, it's best if he joins now, uh, but okay. I haven't got a response back yet. Okay, so if that's the case, we should be ready to start and we can start playing the videos. The COVID-19 pandemic has put education technology in the spotlight like never before. global education is ripe for digital disruption. In 2019, the edtech market was the largest in Asia. And in China alone, edtech is growing by 20% per year. Whilst the APEC region is also likely to witness the highest growth rates in corporate e-learning. In 2018, China accounted for 63% of global edtech investment. No edtech market in the world is as exciting as Asia's for students, corporations, and entrepreneurs. Hong Kong is well positioned as the international gateway to the GBA, the rest of China, and the Asia market. China's Greater Bay Area, or GBA, is an initiative that connects 11 major metropolitan cities throughout southern China. With a population of around 71 million, the region, known as Asia Silicon Valley, covers just 1% of China's landmass, but it accounts for around 12% of China's GDP. And the region is also a promising market for education. With 82% of global education companies planning to expand into the GBA, the region continues to grow as a major center for edtech innovation. After his retirement in 2018, former Hong Kong Financial Secretary John Tsang founded Esperanza, a Hong Kong-based nonprofit NGO. Esperanza actually is a uh, Spanish word that means hope. We wanted to create a platform where we can bring together like-minded people to work together and foster changes for the future. 
In 2019, Esperanza launched the Reimagine Education Movement, and as part of the movement, they have established the Ed Ventures Global Business Acceleration Fellowship. The fellowship will select 12 ventures to join a five-day program in Hong Kong and two other cities in southern China. One of the main challenges that we see for any company that wants to venture abroad is understanding the overseas markets. It's very difficult to just go abroad and just sell stuff. The fellows will have exclusive access to market entry advisors, potential investors, partners, and education and corporate clients. They will also benefit from the advice and support of a distinguished judging panel. The judges will select three winners that will qualify for financial and go-to-market support. Cyberport is a leading digital tech incubator in Hong Kong. They've partnered with Esperanza to co-create the fellowship. Hong Kong is well supported by world-class financial services, professional services, protection of intellectual property, and abundance of venture capital. As part of the fellowship, the participants will attend the Cyberport Venture Capital Forum, or CVCF, where they can meet and match with investors, partners, and clients. So this is the right time, right place. We need the right people. Perhaps now, because of the pandemic, we are finally ready for the EdTech revolution. Connect and interact with seasoned investors and strategic partners around the world. Join the Adventures GBA Fellowship now. We need education innovation more than ever now. Let's create a different future together. rates in corporate e-learning. In 2018, China accounted for 63% of global edtech investment. No edtech market in the world is as exciting as Asia for students, corporations, and entrepreneurs. Hong Kong is well positioned as the international gateway to the GBA, the rest of China, and the Asia market. China's Greater Bay Area, or GBA, is an initiative that connects 11 major metropolitan cities throughout southern China. Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar on EdTech Opportunities in Greater Bay Area. We hope you all enjoyed the short videos about the Adventures GBA Fellowship Program and Cyberport Venture Capital Forum showcasing the relevance of EdTech in Asia today. We are broadcasting today from Hong Kong, hearing from thought leaders and experts from Hong Kong and Shenzhen to discuss the relevance of EdTech in the Greater Bay Area, organized by Esperanza and co-created by Cyberport. We would also like to hear from everyone in the audience, so please do introduce yourselves in the chat box on where you're from and which company you represent, and take this chance to network before we start the panels. The session will host two panels, each for 30 minutes, during that time, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them to us in the Q&A section below in your Zoom taskbar, and we will get to them at the end of the two panels. If anyone encounters tech issues, please do send a message to the host. To kickstart the session, I'd like to invite John Chang to tell us a bit more about Esperanza, the organizer of the Adventures GBA program. 
John needs no introduction, especially to those in Hong Kong, as he has been former financial secretary of Hong Kong SAR government. Over to you, John. Thank you, Zohera. Hello, everybody. I would like to uh, welcome you all to our webinar on EdTech opportunities in the Greater Bay Area. I understand we have a good number of participants from around the world joining us today. So let us get started uh, with a big thank you, first of all, to our webinar facilitators and expert panelists. Now you'll be meeting them in a few moments. My name is John Zhang. Uh, Rachel and I are co-founders of Esperanza, which is a startup NGO that seeks to connect like-minded people everywhere onto a common inclusive platform and channel available community resources to support innovators from Hong Kong and elsewhere in the world to improve the way that we live, learn and work in the 21st century. We believe that we can learn from and collaborate with one another in developing effective solutions with global significance. There is nothing actually more powerful than education in giving hope to and improving the lives of individuals and societies. And that's why we have chosen Reimagine Education as our initial theme. And we have been working on that since our founding in August, 2018. We have since that time launched a series of education related activities. And we are now initiating our latest project with a worldwide invitation for applications to participate in the Adventures GBA Fellowship. As you know, we are playing with the acronym GBA, which carries dual meaning for us. In the context of our fellowship, which aims to help growth stage edtech startups to expand beyond their home markets, it stands for Global Business Acceleration. However, the common usage of GBA also refers to the Greater Bay Area in Southern China. The fellowship seeks to connect edtech businesses around the world with exciting opportunities in this high growth area. The panelists will tell you more about this region later, but let me provide a brief introduction now for those of you who are not yet familiar with this region. The GBA, formerly known as the PRD, the Pearl River Delta region, now comprises the two special administrative regions of Hong Kong and Macau and nine municipalities in the Guangdong province. The Greater Bay Area is one of the most prosperous regions of China with a population of over 70 million, which is 10 times the population of Hong Kong and about 5% of the population of China as a whole. It generates a GDP of 1.5 trillion US dollars, which is about 11% of China's total GDP in 2018, and twice the value of the San Francisco Bay Area. So comparatively speaking, the GBA can be considered the world's 11th largest economy ahead of Russia and just behind Canada. The GBA with its unique mix of financial innovation, manufacturing, and logistical capabilities has prepared a strategic plan to develop itself into an international innovation and technology hub along a cluster of smart cities where citizens enjoy a high standard of quality living. Leveraging on the strengths of Hong Kong as one of the foremost international financial centers, the GBA is also leading the way in facilitating the nation's going global efforts through enhanced international exchanges and cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated how interconnected we are. Despite efforts of some national governments trying to roll back the globalization process, it is actually not plausible to reverse in any significant way international market integration. Even the most pessimistic trade forecasts do not imply a retreat to a world of disconnected national markets. The acceleration of digital transformation induced by the pandemic has also made it a lot easier for us to be connected. The fact that we are doing this seminar with many of you sitting in different parts of the world is an obvious case in point. 
it is true that some politicians are busily making the case for the reshoring of production and labor of late, especially right before key elections, but political rhetoric and economic reality do not always correspond on a one-to-one -one basis. In most cases, it is simply not feasible nor viable for some economies without altering its basic structure to develop within a short period of time the necessary infrastructure, the necessary labor pool and logistical network suitable for such manufacturing activities. We have to consider the value of the markets where some of the manufacturing has been taking place as well. A recent article in the Harvard Business Review illustrated that globalization can be a powerful contributor to growth and health. Under the DHL Global, Connected, Global Connectedness Index, countries with higher scores tend to enjoy faster economic growth. There is also evidence that better connected countries, even after controlling statistically for levels of economic development, are less vulnerable to infectious diseases outbreaks. If wealth and health are the sheer aspiration of humankind, it definitely does not make sense to roll back the tide of globalization. Our panelists today will shortly share with you the developments of the key cities in the Greater Bay Area, opportunities for the edtech business, as well as in particular, how the GBA can serve as a thriving education market, a fundraising center, a R&D testbed for Asia, a design and product development center, a global supply chain management hub, and a launch pad to the global market. The pandemic has upended every aspect of our lives and sparked the world's largest ever remote online learning experiment. If you are a growth stage edtech startup and the GBA proposition resonates with you, apply to join the Adventures GBA Fellowship before the 24th August of this year. You can learn more about the fellowship from our website. You may also wish to follow the fellowship news on our Esperanza page on LinkedIn. We are forming a virtual network now of like-minded people, including all of you in the audience today, to help our change makers scale their work and maximize their impact. Thank you very much. Have a great webinar today. Thank you. Back to you, Sunheya. Thank you, John, for kickstarting that session on a very informative note and reminding us of the value of inter international collaborations. With that, let's begin the first panel on socioeconomic development of the GBA and opportunities for edtech business. This session will be moderated by Eric Chan, Chief Public Mission Officer at Hong Kong Cyberport. Our esteemed panelists include Ming Kwok, CEO and founder of Trump Tech Group, Joe Lam, Managing Director at Pearson Greater China and India Hub, Eunice Chu, Partner Disputes Resolution at Oldham Lee and Lee Solicitors, Catherine Chang, Partner Tax and China Business Advisory Services at PwC Hong Kong, and Laura Shi, Executive Director of Investment at Greater Bay Area Development Fund Management Limited. I'd like to invite Eric now to introduce and moderate the session. Over to you, Eric. Hello, everybody. This is Eric Chen, the Chief Public Mission Officer of Cyberport. Cyberport is a digital technology hub of close to 1,600 startups and tech companies, of which over 100 of them are working in the area of education technology. Many overseas companies see Hong Kong as the perfect place to land in Asia, using Hong Kong as a launch pad for the China GBA region, as well as the neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. And I'm very happy to, today to be the moderator for this upcoming panel. We have lined up a diverse panel of industry leaders, composing of investors, education technology solution provider, education content provider, even partner from Big Four, PwC, and also lawyers you know, with spe spe specialities in IP protections. So without further ado, I would like to uh, get started with our, you know, first topic in this panel. 
um, which is the uh, social economic development of GBA introductions. And I would like to introduce Ms. Laura Shi. Laura uh, is the executive director of GBA Investment um, Management Limited. Laura has over 10 years of experience in investment, advisory, and asset management with comprehensive expertise in the entire investment cycle. And together with Laura, uh, we have Catherine, Catherine Zhang, the partner from PwC. Catherine is a tax and business regulation expert who provides advisory services to investors and government authorities regarding to regions, including but not limited to the GBAs. So over to you, Laura and Catherine. Laura, please. the Greater Bay Area in China. So as you may know that the, the concept was first introduced in 2016 and was officially included in China's national development strategy a year after that. And the GBA comprises Hong Kong, Macau, and the nine cities in Guangdong province, including the, the names, so the city of names that we all know, like Guangzhou, Zhuhai, and Shenzhen. And besides the two figures that like GDP and population that John just mentioned early in the speech, I also want to highlight that GBA enjoys the reputation of Silicon Valley of China, sorry, of Asia, where total number of innovation patents has ranked the first among the four major Bay Areas in the world. The collaboration of Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau is able to give full play to synergy and achieve joint development. The innovation and education resources in Hong Kong, coupled with high level manufacturing capacities in Guangdong, has successfully supported companies like Sense Times, like DGI, in the past few years and making them the world famous unicorn companies. It has been proved as a great strategy to have companies based in the Greater Bay Area and to develop the Chinese market. And that's always the right move to start from Hong Kong. Moreover, the Greater Bay Area has always been promoting institutional innovations. From the financing part, we see the continuous development of leasing policies in the stock exchange of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, including um, providing more financing channels for technology and new economy companies, like the open of registration for companies with VIE and waiting roles writing structure, and the introduction of the NASDAQ style China board and so on. And we believe it's also stimulate early investment on the startup companies in the Bay Area. And that's also why the Greater Bay Area is always attractive to global institutional investors, and even in this challenging year. Later, we have professionals from different industries to share with their experience and view on how to make business development in GBA. And now let's welcome Catherine from PwC. Thank you, Laura. So um, to echo what uh, Laura just mentioned, I believe the objective of the GBA is to become a major global powerhouse with a diverse set of priorities. And definitely the technology and innovations will be the key areas. So I would like to have a supplement. So besides that, what uh, we just mentioned about um, you know, the scale and the size of the GBA, in fact, the governments in um, different cities and uh, both in Hong Kong, Macau, and Guangdong province, they have um, uh, have uh, arranged a lot of uh, infrastructures and facilities in the Greater Bay areas. As an example, the Hong Kong government, um, they are now constructing the Hong Kong Shenzhen Innovations and Technology Park at Noma Chow. So uh, it is, uh, we understand that the first, you know, the first batch of the land parcels will be provided uh, latest by 2021. And uh, also um, the uh, and the Hong Kong government, they also uh, will increase the scientific research fundings and related supports. And uh, also the, um, the Hong Kong government will invest in the local innovation and technology startups um, through the, because of venture fund. 
besides, um, the Guangdong government, they also provide a lot of support. Recently, uh, it has been announced that there will be a the Shenzhen Hong Kong Innovation and Technology Cooperation Zone will be um, will be built and developed, and it will provide a platform for both the Hong Kong co you know the college and also the research institutes uh, with the provincial and sufficient resources for scientific research and to strengthen the cross boundary cooperation. So besides those uh, infrastructures and uh, facilities, there are also um, a lot of you know, support from the Hong Kong government and the governments of the Guangdong province for introducing a lot of incentive policies and measures for those startups and also the corporations. Like um, the, the new funding scheme launched by, launched by the Hong Kong government under the Youth Development Fund, um, they have two uh, new funding schemes called Youth Entrepreneurship and Exper Experiential Programs at Innovations and Entrepreneurial. So both are providing some uh, you know, financial support for those startups. And also the um, governments of the Guangdong province, they extend the Science and Technology um, Innovation Fund to Hong Kong and Macau youth with business startups in Guangdong areas. And also they are going to set up, we call it funnel funds and feeder funds supporting the Macau and Hong Kong youth in startup business as well, if they are having a project in the uh, Guangdong province. And also um, the municipal governments in the GBA area, um, they have announced uh, some sort of the tax incentive programs um, to the startup and also to, to the, you know, the talents who are uh, working in the GBA area, um, which is a very, uh, in fact, it is very famous. Um, the individual's income tax, they are trying to cap at 15% of the taxable income for those uh, individuals and uh, they are working in, in the GBA area. And also for the income tax, if they are providing all, uh, the qualified services, they are the income, the corporate income tax rate will be reduced to 15%, comparing with the 25% uh, the normal rate. So um, just as a sum up, I, I would say um, there is no doubt with the, the above mentions um, uh, infrastructures, facilities, government supports, funding programs, no doubt um, it would unleash the economic development and uh, in the GBA area and create abundant business opportunities for both young entrepreneurs and also the corporations that they are looking for, to do the business with or within the regions. So I, I you know, Rarek, back to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and th thank you, Laura. So um, now we let, let's get a deep dive into the edge, uh, education technology opportunities in GBA. And I would like to get started by inviting two of our panelists to talk about some market entry tips. And they are Mr. Ming Kwok, the CEO and founder of Trump Tech Group. Ming is actually in, and uh, Edge Tech Advocate for over 20 years, focusing on tailoring Edge Tech solutions for Hong Kong and China market. And then we also have Mr. Joe Lam, the Managing Director of Pearson, Greater China and India Hub. Joe has extensive experience in education industry across the APAC region, active in cultivating digital transformations of educations. So over to you, Ming. Hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see uh, you all in cyberspace. Uh, just wondering, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about the uh, education opportunities, particularly at the ag tech market in the uh, Greater Bay Area, well, you wouldn't be surprised that, uh, you know, uh, there's huge opportunities. Just uh, uh, if you um, read about the uh, re uh, recent uh, re uh, report uh, from Deloitte or any others. So um, if you look at the preschool education market, you would be surprised that uh, uh, many families, they spend around like uh, from 2000 something to 5000 RMB per month. Um, so if you add it up like it's almost like a few million middle class families to almost 10 million uh, families, middle class families in the Great Bay area, you can, um, uh, 
well, you are, we are talking about a huge amount of money. So uh, um, in, you, you know that like uh, the Asians, they look up to um, children education uh, very much. So we almost put it as the top priority. But at the same time, actually, uh, many, many families are um, facing lots of um, 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 difficulty in how to educate their children better. So um, they spend lots of time and effort in, in order to squeeze into those prestigious uh, schools so that they have to make sure their children will be successful. However, you know that the, that the very best school is limited in number. And um, so in many cases, the children could not be um, uh, very much uh, educated by a very good teachers, so um, that's why I can imagine, you know, if you if uh, the tech market can solve this kind of, you know, um, um, unequalness in having this um, better education opportunities, so you can imagine many parents would like to pay for it, right? So um, I would say, like, um, if we consider. Your, uh, you use uh, the active market in the crypto Bay area, you will think about like, or oh, shall I um, start in Hong Kong or in um, crypto Bay area in, in, in mainland China? So I would suggest uh, probably um, if we consider Hong Kong where the education, well, is considered to be one of the best in the world, and also is openness uh, and together with lots of infrastructure support as what the previous um, speakers they mentioned about. So it's a very good testing bed for many new, particularly um, um, the startup to test the market, to understand the um, um, schools and parents on your technologies before you move into um, the mainland China, which is of course the huge market, but also you need to spend lots of effort in order to develop your market there and get penetration in, um, into schools or families. So Hong Kong is a very good position for you to, you know, to test back your technologies as well as to, uh, you know, uh, uh, fine tuning your, uh, technologies, whether it's really fit to um, the schools and um, to the um, and to the children to, to use. So unlike uh, other uh, Bay areas, like talking about like maybe um, um, San Francisco or uh, Tokyo, etc. So the, the Great Bay Area has quite a unique uh, ecosystem because you know that the education system in China is very different to Hong Kong. And um, that's why um, if you, well, having said that, maybe many of them, they, you think that it's very difficult to do um, the um, education business in China. Yes, to a certain extent, it is correct. However, I found that if you are talking about ag tech business from my 20 years of experiences, mainlanders are more willing to pay for the digital um, uh, digital resources than our Hong Kong parents. You, you will be surprised, but it is, it, it, it is the real situation that uh, I experienced this last 20 years. So if I sell a digital product in China, talking about, okay, 1,000 RMB uh, per year, the parents are really willing to, you know, to pay for it, providing that it is good for, to their children. However, in Hong Kong, it may not be the case, but, but if Hong Kong parents are happy to pay for it, what it means is you will have even bigger market opportunities in mainland China. So just echo back to what I said, Hong Kong actually is really a very good aspect for the ag tech industry to make sure that you are in the right track, you are developing the right products before you are expanding to a bigger uh, market. 
So maybe I I I leave it to um, um, Joe for more comment on the opportunities. Thank you. Um, I I think it's it's great opportunity to share some of the uh, different market in in China and what's the uniqueness of the GBA. I think mean, in Beijing, Shanghai, and GBA traditionally this is the ad hoc uh, for majority of the company that we start with. In Beijing, particularly, it's very strong in the public education system. You can see quite a lot of the ad tech start, but it's focusing in the uh, K twelve public education system, like uh, Joy Bong and all this. They are all from the traditional classical uh, education company, like from New Oriental or from Baidu. All this in Shanghai is more focusing on the mobile application side, where GBA is one of the uniqueness is which is they are combination of the hardware, software, business model which is quite different from the other market areas. And I would say uh, the traditional area in the uh, GBA area, there's a strong uh, in the manufacturing, especially in the electronic areas. So a combination of hardware plus software, that is one of the uniqueness in this area. And in the past couple of the years, we have quite a lot of investment in, in China, particularly in the ad tech company. We find that is two key uh, success factors. One is the business model. The innovative of the business model um, is not some, some something very unique, like say for example, live tutoring, which has happened so many years, but the way they innovate and then to drive the interest of the customer to purchase the services. I think this is the uniqueness in China in terms of the business model, where this is the, 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 the area that will help you to drive more scalable business to grow. And the second one, which is what, um, it mentioned about is the pay model. The way it pay is quite flexible in here because they have a lot of like Alipay, WeChat Pay and a lot of way. So it means the people, the purchase is much more easier than before. It ranged from very low price, maybe free of charge to up to the point like 50,000 yuan. It's not a surprise. That is always the parents willing to pay. And the most differences in here is the pattern is the people willing to pay for the knowledge. And that is one of the culture they built up in the last couple of the years. What I could say is in the last couple of the years is a lot of the uh, ad tech company it grow faster is because of their uh, knowledge. Is that is the key area. And I could see quite a lot of the um, the new startup they are quite innovative in terms of the offering the uh, services is including like combination is like something like piano. Piano training in the past is you must have the face-to-face -face human interaction. And now it's combination of hardware, software, business model, all this. They can offer the physical training and they go over the piano, interest class, STEM, all this can go online. So I, I think there's a couple of areas for ad tech um, a startup company. I would advise them to utilize the benefits of GBA is one is I would say capital here is quite a lot of capital uh, funding still floating around in GBA area. And second one is there's a lot of the good um, hardware manufacturers because if you're purely talking about just an apps, I think that is too many apps in the, in the market. But if you're talking about a combination of all kind of the different types of the um, uh, offering, and then that will create the experience of the customer is very important. I think most important is the user experience. Um, uh, in China, a lot of new ad companies they are focusing on user experience. I think that will be the key success factor. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Ming. So now that we have a better understanding of the market entry strategy for um, many of our startups. So since we're talking about you know, uh, GBA as a whole, and I would like to invite Joe back you know, to give us a sharing about what you see in terms of the respective strengths of the different GBA cities, you know, the roles they played um, in the edge tech market, in particularly cities like Shenzhen, uh, Guangzhou, or Dongguan, and possibly other GBA cities. Please, Joe. Yeah, I think in Shenzhen is very much different. We can tell from the population mix. Here, I would say I'm in Shenzhen right now, and majority of the people is the newly, uh, I would say, cannot be called immigrant, but they are all from the other provinces. And they are building up the new family, their average uh, family income is much higher than in Guangzhou. And you can tell from the property pricing. So if you're talking about the different city within GBA, I would say Shenzhen is one of the most, uh, I would say, higher GDP uh, city. 
and the people willing to accept more new product and new business model, and also they're willing to test something new. So if you want to start up something new, I think uh, Shenzhen is the good start point. Where traditionally the Guangzhou is a large population and they radiate to the uh, nearby city, but the Guangzhou, the limitation is they have a very restricted, um, I would say, restricted way in terms of education policy. Uh, they are not much flexible in terms of the policy way. So if you want to start something new, and I would suggest you to can start with the uh, Shenzhen here, but where compared with the other city like Zhuhai or Zhongshan or this, because the income level is much lower. So you may not expect it's the same level of the market you want to conquer. So uh, it's similar to rest of the British, uh, I would say China cities, tier one, tier two, all this. Fast growing city in, uh, in, in GBA area must be in those of the tier three, tier four, like in those of area like Zhongshan, Zhuhai, or in uh, Fusan, they will be very fast growing. But in the real, if you want to conquer some customer with, with the good income and your position as more premium services, Shenzhen or Guangzhou will be the better options. Thank you, Joe. So, um... Now, many of us are actually from Hong Kong, and we definitely want Hong Kong you know, to play an important part and an important role in this GBA and tech market. So um, we will invite many of our panelists to join in to talk about the roles of Hong Kong in this um, you know, edge tech GBA uh, expansion game plan. But I would like to introduce um, uh, one of the panelists first. Um, it's um, Ms. Eunice Chiu. She is the partner of uh, a, law, a law firm, OLN Solicitors. And uh, she's a partner on, in disputes resolution. And Eunice is a, is, an, uh, is a legal expert with extensive experience in cross-border trademark and IP registration. And then uh, we also would like to have uh, Catherine uh, join in, uh, John back you know, to this discussion. And, any of the you know, panelists, you can chip in as well later on. Um, over to you, Eunice, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Eunice. Um, so in, in addition to the IP work that I do, I also do arbitration work. And I think Hong Kong is a great launch pad and gateway into the GBA area. Uh, the firm and myself, we've been doing uh, cross-border transactions uh, between Macau, Hong Kong, and uh, different parts of China um, for, for a number of years, uh, even before the commencement of the, the GBA uh, initiative. And um, the reason why I think Hong Kong is important is that it plays a very, uh, it offers a neutral ground in the arbitration area. What is arbitration? Arbitration is resolving your disputes outside of the courtroom. So when parties do business, they enter into contracts and within the contracts, you can choose to privately settle those disputes that will ultimately come or hopefully if you have a good uh, contract in place and everybody behaves, then you don't need to go there. But arbitration is the parties choose a number of, uh, a number of arbitrators, one or three, usually in odd numbers, and um, you resolve your disputes there. It's an efficient system. Um, it's probably slightly more expensive than going to court, but um, Hong Kong, the HKIAC, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, offers a very, very good venue. It's close to the GBA area. Um, it's right in central in Hong Kong. And uh, what we have in addition to the hardware is that um, we have uh, many, uh, we have two important laws, pieces of law that allow for mutual recognition of arbitral awards. So the arbitral award is essentially the judgment. So in the courtroom, the judge would give this award, uh, but in arbitration, an arbitrator uh, judges uh, who wins and how much they win in damages. Uh, we have the um, mutual or uh, arrangement concerning mutual enforcement of arbitral awards between the mainland and Hong Kong. So since the beginning of this uh, legislation in 1999, um, 
there have only been three arbitral awards that have not been mutually recognized. So whatever's awarded in Hong Kong, um, it's enforceable in China. For example, there are some assets in China that you want to um, go after as a result of this award being given to you, that will be recognized in China. Um, also, Hong Kong is one of the uh, five seats of arbitration that's popular around the world. It's very, very important for international disputes as well. So if there is an international aspect outside of the GBA area, that's part of this, um, the, the deal, the transaction that that you're working on, um, even in edtech, um, I've seen those arbitration clauses in the in contracts between counterparties. Uh, you you should consider using um, Hong Kong, the HKIAC. Um, there are many different arbitral rule, rules out there. Um, most popular most popular ones are the UNCTRA rules and the HKIAC rules. And um, we have one more um, innovative uh, piece of legislation, which is, oh, sorry, it's, it's not innovative, but it's the New York Convention of which Hong Kong is a party. So you can get to enforce your awards in many different parts of the world, North America, Europe, uh, rest of Asia and so on. So that's arbitration. Um, in, on, in terms of intellectual property, uh, I'll be, Quick because I realized I shouldn't go on uh, into a lecture. But um, for intellectual property, um, uh, the systems of registration can be a little bit different between Hong Kong and China. Um, but what we do have is um, a, a system that complements each other. If you register your trademark in Hong Kong, you have a six month window of priority, where if you register in China, i.e. in Beijing, um, you can gain priority as long as you're within those first six months. So that's um, intellectual property 101. But for for many reasons, um, Hong Kong as a as a uh, a city can be a good gateway into the GBA area in providing lots of uh, legal resources. Uh, and I've only just mentioned two. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Eunice. And uh, Catherine, you have something to add? Yes, of course. Um, I think we all agree that Hong Kong will be being as an international financial center. Um, definitely, Hong Kong will take up the role of providing the platform of the investment and financing. So, um, yeah, this is our strength, you know. And Hong Kong can um, would also help to promote the domestic and international financial cooperations. And, uh, you know, uh, provide offshore remedy business because we are talking about the markets in the GBA area. And then green finance and those quality uh, financial and wealth management related consultancy services. Those are the, you know, the opportunities right now um, for the uh, financial markets in Hong Kong. But besides, I, w I would like to echo, you know, you, uh, Eunice just mentioned about the IP, you know, international properties registrations. <coughs> because we also want to promote Hong Kong as a IP registrations and trading hub. Um, you know, um, we are uh, with it for the uh, internet IP, you know, uh, registrations and trading hub, it will create a lot of opportunities, uh, again, for the professional um, services in Hong Kong, like the valuation, uh, financial, you know, and also the, you know, the M&A activities, because if the IP is being registered in Hong Kong, then it will create lots of, you know, um, uh, I would say buy and sell uh, transactions in Hong Kong. So the, uh, and also it will also benefit the, for, for those uh, financial, um, you know, services uh, petitioners. So I think um, these are the, the things that um, Hong Kong can definitely uh, have the, you know, the roles and responsibility in the developments of the GBA. And also because we are all understand, we are all, um, agree that um, Hong Kong, the tertiary education in Hong Kong is, is well, well, well developed and uh, well respected. So I think Hong Kong can leverage on um, its strength in the teaching, research and internationalizations to provide the quality education and nurture the, the talents uh, for, the, uh, for the developments of the GBA area. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And I think we have a few minutes left. And uh, I would like to see if other panelists could also chip in about you know, the role of Hong Kong in this GBA uh, edge tech market. Anyone? 
maybe I, I could add a bit more is I, I think in Hong Kong, I think we have a very strong in terms of the uh, content development. I, I think that is the variety of the different types of the content we offer. And um, I think one of the challenges for EdCat to, to start up with is the content. I think this is the major missing area because you can create a very good um, software, you can have a lot of good hardware, you have a creative business model, but finally you still need to have the good content as well as a pathological design in the education area. So I think this is one of the strengths of for Hong Kong because over a couple of the last uh, maybe 100 years experience in building up a uh, kind of the comprehensive education system and then with a lot of the uh, interaction with China, I think this is the strength for Hong Kong. It's not limited to just in terms of the technology. But with the technology, I think ad tech's the most important area is how to transform the technology and, and learning to become is more uh, uh, learner centric and more outcome centric. I think this is one of the strengths that Hong Kong can better add in this area. Thank you, thank you, Joe. And uh, I would like to take this chance to remind everyone that uh, you can actually raise your questions in the chat box, but then we won't answer you right now because we'll leave it to the question and answer time after the second panel. But then you can actually continually you know, chip in your questions uh, for us to collect uh, for the later on discussions, All right? So I think uh, we are almost, you know, time's up. And, um, and I would like to thank all the panelists for their very insightful sharing. And uh, let's get ready for the second panel. Thank you. Over to you, back to your host, please. Thank you, Eric, and the panelists for that uh, very in-depth and informative discussion. Some very good points on market opportunities for edtech businesses, especially the ones attending today's webinar. Um, very quickly, if I may ask um, all the panelists from panel one to pause for a quick screenshot photo. Take the photo. And the photo sir. Turn your cameras on. Oh, I'm a little bit. Oh, yeah. Start video. Okay. So we are getting everyone back, you know, for group photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes we for, forget about this. <laughs> yeah. Where? We still need Catherine, Joe, and Ming back. I think the host need to turn on my video. It has been disabled. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. doing it. My video also disabled. Joe. Okay, we have Ming back. And, and Catherine? Thank you. And Catherine? Uh, yes. I cannot start my video. Um, yeah. Catherine? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. We are working on it. Yeah, just hang on a minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> So welcome back <laughs> for the photo time. <laughs> okay, we'll take the photo in uh, one, two, three, cheese. Great, thank you so much. And thank you, Eric, once again. Thank you. Thank you. A reminder to our audience today to um, send us your questions in the Q&A section. And like Eric mentioned, we will be getting to them at the end of the uh, panel. So let's begin our second panel, uh, GBA as Product Development Supply Chain Management Hub. The session will be moderated by Derek Quick, Managing Partner of Brave Soldier Venture Capital. Derek is also a member of the Adventures GBA Fellowship Betting Panel. Our esteemed panelists include Kevin Brispois, Director of Sales and Corporate Partnerships at Brink, Vincent Kwok, Co-Founder of Corporate Hub Limited, Chad Vixu, co-founder and CEO at Shenzhen Valley Ventures, and Stanley Zhou, project director of LKKERSEM. I'd like to invite now Derek to introduce and moderate the session. Over to you, Derek. 
Thank you for uh, for having me. Uh, great to be the moderator on this panel with our, our distinguished uh, uh, guests. Um, I guess I we 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 in in the previous uh, uh, panel and, and how it connects to this one is is uh, uh, we were talking about the, the Greater Bay uh, area and I think for a lot of you that are, are not living in Hong Kong that are uh, living abroad uh, uh, particularly in, in Europe um, have heard this word over and over again and and in in some cases it's it's almost an overused word and and uh, what I really like about this particular session is that we're able to sort of do a deeper dive into the boots on the ground uh, of what GBA actually means. And uh, to me, uh, that is, is uh, it's far more enriching because you're able to hear from uh, people who are actually on the ground uh, in, in these regions, uh, in, in these cities to talk about what their actual experiences are as opposed to uh, uh, being able to, uh, to read about it, but actually hear about uh, firsthand experiences. Um, what I'd like to do first is, is introduce our, our, our guests. Um, I think it might be better if, if we could, uh, if, if each of you uh, could, uh, could just give a, a quick 60 second intro on who you are. I know on, on the website, uh, everybody's able to do that or, or read into their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, but if you could just do a quick uh, 60 second intro, um, I'll start with myself. Uh, for me, uh, being in, in venture capital, uh, uh, investing in, in startups, uh, all in the technology space, uh, my connection uh, to uh, the Greater Bay Area is, is uh, for me, I, I, I went to Shenzhen in 1994. That was my first trip there. And uh, I'll, I'll highlight some of the experiences I had uh, in that uh, later on. Uh, and then just having come in and out of, of Shenzhen, Dongguan, Guangzhou, uh, but being based in Hong Kong and having my experiences there um, and then having a, a, a deeper um, passion uh, towards youth education initiatives, uh, being part of different youth education enterprises uh, and local universities um, in, in Hong Kong. Um, so um, I'd like to sort of, let's turn it over to first Kevin to uh, just give, give a, a little uh, one minute intro about yourself and then we'll move on to the others. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Derek. So Kevin Brisboys, um, I'm originally from Boston, Massachusetts in the US, um, moved to China back in 2009. I started in manufacturing um, and eventually moved on to product development, uh, mostly for uh, big Fortune 500 corporate clients. Um, and recently, about a year and a half ago, I made the move to Brink, which is a global venture accelerator. So we are one of the largest accelerators in the world with over 140 investments to date over the last five years. We invest in early stage technology companies looking to solve some of the world's biggest problems. So we're looking at how people live, how we eat, how we move, how we feel. And, and certainly a big part of our portfolio looks at uh, new and emerging technology and markets. So, for us in particular, EdTech creates so many opportunities. Um, for us, I think what also makes us quite unique is we've uh, identified very early on that you know, a lot of companies, it's, it's important at the early stage for them to get the right kind of support that they need. So for us, we don't only just invest in uh, digital companies, but also hardware companies. So for us, understanding how we can support founders uh, both giving access into the manufacturing and supply chain ecosystem within the region um, and, and how to grow their business uh, in this area is really important for us. So really excited to share more uh, throughout the panel uh, and thanks everyone for joining. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, how about you, Winston? Oh, I'm back from the state um, and then I came back to Hong Kong and I started Copper Hub. So Core has been very active in Shenzhen and Hong Kong to helping up startups for the past five years. And then um, I'm also a, a, a part of a robot company. And then that robot company, when I first met, um, they don't start anything yet. So I was with them from the beginning until now. So I kind of understand how they take advantage of the Bay area to help their product to develop and how they look for different supplies to, to make the product come true. 
and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Chadwick. Yeah, uh, Chadwick Chu. Uh, I came to Shenzhen on, in 1992, right after the uh, Deng Xiaoping made the, the opening up uh, speech and uh, started working for a corporate a company for, for 11 years and uh, co-founded uh, my first company, the uh, Zaoyi Technology. And uh, that company was listed uh, in 2010. So it's uh, like a first con type of uh, company, the, the uh, manufacturer, the, uh, uh, working for Huawei, Xiaomi, and other major brands in China. And uh, currently, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, working for my second uh, adventure, the, the SVB. And uh, we want to make a, make a test whether this model can work out. And we want to combine uh, engineering service and uh, which capital together. And the, uh, the, uh, we started the engineering platform uh, in, uh, in 2016. And uh, we've been working with, uh, with uh, corporate innovation uh, arms. Uh, universities and the startup company, and the uh, uh, after we put put together the uh, the resources from uh, from all these uh, entities, uh, big company, uh, corporate, uh, university, and uh, start startup startup company, and the uh, uh, if they can uh, start collaboration between themselves uh, in in the in uh, in the hub of SVB, uh, we'll be creating our our uh, uh, corporate driven uh, wind capital that's a that's a that's a that's a invest for the purpose of uh, of corporate and uh, we announced a, a joint joint program together with capgemini the the i believe the, is one of the leading uh, consulting company in uh, globally and the uh, uh, where we work starting working together uh, to bring in corporate innovation projects and uh, and after players come in thank you uh, Stanley, uh, could you uh, give us a, a, a 60 second intro of, of, of yourself? Uh, oh, okay, no problem. Uh, actually, uh, I, came, uh, in, I came to Dongguan uh, in, in 2000, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2000, yes. And I, uh, I have several uh, jobs yeah, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, mechanical design and then uh, tooling and design. And uh, now I'm a, a project director. And uh, now uh, I work for uh, LKK. As, as you know, LKK is the largest uh, design group. Actually, we have several type of uh, service that we can provide. Yeah, from the uh, ID design, the mechanical design, uh, electronic design, and until most production. Especially uh, our uh, service that is uh, supply chain management, yeah, and can provide one-stop service. And especially uh, focus on having some uh, startup company to develop a new product in, in China. And uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, cases now, and uh, which is very successful. And uh, now, nowadays, uh, our uh, LKK have over uh, 30, uh, 36 uh, subsidiaries uh, in China and uh, four subsidiaries overseas. And uh, later on, uh, probably I can introduce some, uh, yeah, some experience of us uh, in, in and develop a new product. Okay, that's all. Thank you for that. So these are our our guests here uh, who can elaborate on their experiences. And I just kind of wanted to bring us back to uh, uh, the Greater Bay Area. I know that uh, John Zhang had, uh, when he first gave his uh, introduction, he talked about some of the really key interesting facts about uh, GBA. Um, and there's certain ones that, that, that really stuck out in my mind, um, as well as some other ones that, that I also uh, uh, know of. Um, and just a couple of them here are, are that uh, uh, the Great City Bay Area comprises of 11 cities. And what's really interesting about these 11, 11, uh, 11 cities is that they're, they're all connected. They're, all of their contributions are very unique unto themselves. And uh, what, what, one thing that I've seen uh, globally is a lot of cities and smaller countries are connecting themselves together to become a, a more powerful force uh, in, in, um, in the community. Uh, one example um, uh, that I have is, is uh, that's outside of China is actually um, in, in the, the Nordic region in, in Europe is, is all of the Nordic countries are, are, are sort of coming together and, and also uh, banding together and connecting all of their expertises uh, together to become a, a more powerful, more outspoken um, uh, community. Um, similarly, in, in China, uh, 
the total population of these 11 cities is more is, is, is larger than the UK or two times the population of Canada. Uh, that gives you a perspective of, of how big it is, even though all of these cities um, only represent 1% of the land mass, uh, but 12% of, of GDP. And the air freight traffic uh, is bigger than San Francisco, uh, New York, and Tokyo uh, combined. And of the 10 largest uh, container ports in the world, three out of 10 of them are, are based uh, in, in the GBA. So um, uh, there's, there's other obvious ones like Hong Kong. Uh, its role here is, is obviously um, one of the biggest financial markets in the world. Uh, so that, that makes it uh, very strategic in terms of its, its proximity uh, to, to the GBA. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, movement. And when you connect that to um, uh, the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative that China has, um, that's not part of this discussion. You can read up on that. It really starts to make sense in terms of like how all of this is, is connected uh, together. Uh, but bringing us back to GBA, um, one of the cities, at least for me, that, that's very special uh, within the GBA is, is Shenzhen. And uh, because of that, Hong Kong and Shenzhen, you're, you're talking about a 30-minute car ride across the border. It's so close. Uh, and, um, and of course, as we all know, uh, Shenzhen is a, is a huge manufacturing hub for China, uh, specifically in technology. Um, and that's also kind of expanded out into Dongguan and also uh, into uh, uh, Guangzhou. Uh, my experience, as I mentioned before, uh, was the first time going into Shenzhen was, was in, in 1994, 1995. Um, and since then, I've had over 500 day trips uh, in, into uh, uh, Shenzhen, Dongguan, and, and Guangzhou, uh, specifically to go to factories and walk the production line. And it's really amazing to, to think that Made in China and made in Shenzhen are actually two different meanings today. Uh, made in Shenzhen today, that, that really denotes uh, a higher quality of, of manufacturing. It's, it's amazing to think about how uh, your smartphone today comes from China, specifically from, uh, uh, from, from the Greater Bay Area. Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, so it, it's a higher level of, 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 uh, of, of manufacturing um, and it's great because, um, and this is what I wanted to sort of bring uh, Stanley into, into this conversation, is, is really to talk about uh, the manufacturing side in terms of like product design and, and prototyping. Because today, as a factory uh, in China, you cannot service uh, global clients unless you have that design capability. Because clients come to you seeking that, that design capability. Um, it's, it's really amazing uh, for me to go to a, a factory and, and something like, let's say, this, which is an electronic cigarette, and to have them go through that design and, and put this together and help with the design and the prototyping and actually to put this out to, to market globally um, within a very short period of time is, is, is amazing. Um, so uh, I'd like to first start off with, with Stanley. Uh, to to sort of give his his uh, his uh, his view on that, um, and then I'd also like to pull in uh, Kevin and and Chadwick uh, as well. Okay, now I will share my screen. Hello, I'm. So, uh, can you can you see my school now? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. So uh, yeah, this time I, I want to share some uh, experience uh, in, in design and uh, uh, development. And the first thing is that uh, if we start our uh, new project, uh, we need to identify that uh, our uh, idea or our product, uh, is it the, uh, the good idea? Uh, is it to be accepted by the market or by the, by the user? So that's why I, I wanted to uh, discuss the golden idea. 
So what is the uh, golden idea here? Actually, uh, I prepare uh, two cases. So uh, you can see uh, the, the picture. Yeah, here, actually, he, uh, this device is to help the uh, uh, doctor to diagnose the patient, uh, see if they have uh, epilepsy. Yeah, so uh, just with two devices, one is the headband. Yeah, you can uh, put on your head and uh, then mm -hmm. And uh, with this portable device, uh, you can uh, get the result within six uh, or, or yes, or about, or about, uh, about six minutes. But uh, traditionally, uh, uh, when you uh, yeah, with some uh, for example, <coughs> for example, if someone go to the uh, 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 hospital and to uh, check the ECG or, or EEG, uh, definitely they will see a very big device. Actually, this is. Uh, this is the same uh, function yeah, with our uh, this uh, this device. And uh, uh, in comparison, yeah, the picture shows that this device is very uh, small and uh, can get the result uh, very very fast. And uh, so in this case, uh, when the patient uh, go to the hospital, they no need to wait yeah, because just uh, with a very uh, short time, yeah, they can get the result. And uh, secondly. Uh, the, yeah, this device is very uh, cost effective with very low uh, cost. And uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, the second point yeah, that uh, compared with the, the traditional uh, device. So uh, from this uh, perspective, uh, definitely uh, as, a normal, uh, as a normal people, definitely yeah, they will choose uh, this device. And uh, so from this way, uh, we can see uh, this device is a uh, regional demand. That means the patient will have to choose this one in comparison with the traditional device. Yeah, so this, so this, this is how uh, I, I see a rigid demand. So on contrary, uh, we I will show the, the second one. Yeah, so you can see the second one. Uh, so this uh, device, uh, the function of this device is very common. Uh, like uh, have a heart rate uh, to can check the heart rate can check the breath or can check the uh, curry and or uh, can check the, uh, uh, can count the step. So uh, uh, we have seen a lot of similar product uh, on the market. So uh, if uh, other people, yeah, if other uh, ordinary people, if they, uh, without this device, uh, actually that won't uh, hurt us something. So uh, in this way, uh, we can use it or not uh, that, uh, uh, do not have a certain uh, effect to us. So uh, based on compared to these two uh, device, the first one that is to mean we have to choose it. Yeah, when some patient go to the hospital, so definitely uh, we can get a very high sales. Yeah. So uh, this is what uh, I want to share to some, uh, especially to some uh, startup companies because uh, uh, at LKK we have a lot of cases. Uh, they. Uh, uh, have the similar uh, situation because they are, uh, firstly, they go to LKK, they feel that uh, their idea is really uh, excellent, have a very uh, amazing function, but uh, uh, the right way to judge that your product is good or not, that is the market, that is the function, see if it is a rigid demand. So this is the uh, first uh, point I wanted to uh, yeah, to uh, share with some uh, startup company yeah, to identify that their function, uh, the function of their product, uh, is it uh, rigid or uh, pseudo demand, then it will be better for them to ensure the project goes successful. Yeah, so this is the uh, uh, first point I want to uh, share. This and uh, secondly- Stanley, um, I'm sorry, and, if I can um, interrupt for just, just one second. Is um, in the interest of time, uh, can we uh, uh, give Kevin and uh, uh, Chadwick a time to uh, respond? And then um, at the end of the session, if we have uh, any time left, then um, uh, we can come back to you on your on your presentation. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you, um, Kevin. I think just as as a um, uh, as as one of the sort of the 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 key players in the ecosystem, uh, uh, can you also talk about uh, your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. So I think one thing first to understand in terms of the ecosystem is that it, it's so rich and diverse. You have so many companies that have been created over the years that 
focus purely on design and development. You have digital companies, you have manufacturers that are doing development. So for me, a, a really big part of what I do in terms of supporting startups trying to enter this region is trying to give access to the ecosystem and to understand what are you trying to achieve? And what kind of partners are you looking for? You could work with very large suppliers that work with Fortune 100 companies. You could work with smaller suppliers and partners that will give you maybe more attention and more attractive pricing. But I think what's unique in particular about the GBA is through the nine uh, different cities and throughout this region, you, you can really find everything in one place. And, and I think that's important to understand, especially for, for those companies that are listening that are combining both hardware and digital solutions, because it, it's, it's quite challenging when you're trying to launch uh, a new product and you're working with suppliers in different countries and different regions. I think you know, that's one of the unique advantages that I've seen. And again, having suppliers that are in Hong Kong that within 30 minutes to an hour could get on site to visit a supplier in Shenzhen or to pull components from a factory in Guangzhou that's an hour and a half away. You know, that's so compelling. And although on paper, you might not see the advantage of it initially when you're looking at building a product, I, I've seen time and time again, the, the value of companies that have centralized their supply chain in the region and the benefits of it throughout the project to accelerate the overall uh, time to market. I think supply chain is, is a very good point that you bring up. And, and I think Chadwick also has examples of corporates that he can uh, elaborate on. Uh, sure. The, um, actually, uh, uh, I came to Shenzhen in 1992 and uh, I almost witnessed uh, the growth of, uh, of the dramatic growth of Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Uh, if we look back, uh, the success of Hong Kong and, uh, and Shenzhen in 1990s and early 2000 uh, is based on the uh, is based on on the timing. That's, that's, a, that's a China uh, is becoming has been becoming the the world's uh, supplier for for goods. So the uh, and the Hong Kong Hong Kong uh, becomes the the transition hub uh, for the goods. Uh, but now the the time uh, changes. The the uh, uh, the uh, serving as as uh, as the transition hub of uh, of goods is very tough. Uh, currently, I think the uh, the GBA what GBA is bringing over though is that the uh, whether <clears throat> Hong Kong and Shenzhen are together is just uh, just uh, I would say the the GBA as a as the GBA as a whole uh, could serve as a technology transition hub between China and uh, the rest of the world. And uh, if that logic uh, is, uh, is uh, stands, uh, we can find um, a huge opportunity for uh, for both sides. I mean, the the uh, now uh, under GBA, uh, Hong Kong is becoming an essential element uh, of GBA uh, uh, as a whole. But the uh, Hong Kong is a very unique uh, element uh, in GBA. Uh, the the uh, the governing the governing law uh, and also the the, the environment is uh, is. Uh, it's uh, much friendly uh, to Western visitors, and the uh, if they could uh, build a build a synergy uh, between uh, in, in the major elements in in, in, in in GBA, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and other area, uh, it could create a huge opportunity for for all the, all the parties and join in. And uh, I've been witnessing, I've been seeing the uh, uh, a lot of uh, corporate. Is uh, setting up their their innovation office in in Hong Kong and uh, and uh, China and, and Shenzhen and the uh, I myself have been have been uh, in close collaboration with uh, with uh, with uh, Kevin and and Brian and so we are sharing the the same group of uh, of uh, of those visitors uh, corporate side and also startup company side. Thank you for that. I think just the the, the role of Hong Kong, obviously in finance, but also as an ecosystem and the intellectual capital from all over the world, uh, people that, that come here, and that Hong Kong is a launch point uh, to travel around the region, uh, quality of life, all of these things are, are important. Uh, but one of the most important things that I, uh, that I see is, is before you decide to uh, get your business going, obviously the most important thing is to get the framework of your business set up. 
And uh, uh, one of the most important people in this virtual room here is Winston, Winston Kwok, who, uh, who knows how to uh, set up your entity correctly, uh, everything from a tax perspective to jurisdictions. Um, all of those things are, are very important uh, before you, you start to do your business. Um, and I think it, it, this would be a, a perfect time for, for Winston to come in and, and, and talk about that. There was a recent article about a, a company called Miro. Uh, they, they, they're an AI company um, and uh, they, they were impacted by setting up uh, their entity. Um, I, I don't remember where they had set it up, but they, they I guess they didn't think about the, the, uh, thinking about how, what, where's the best place to strategic, strategically set up their business. Um, so from your perspective, um, uh, maybe you could tell our listeners um, uh, what, what things to look out for. Um, from my perspective is that um, I always suggest, uh, even though when I'm in Shenzhen or in Greater Bay Area, when I'm really meet some startups, I will always tell them to start um, their first structure in Hong Kong first. It's because when it kind of, kind of like, after the product is set up, when I try to ship to the other places, right? Hong Kong is not only a place that um, easier to attract the foreign attention, attention, and also when they really do a trade or they really sell the product, uh, the, the foreigners will be more upset with the Hong Kong law pro protective. So I was always tell them to set up in Hong Kong first and then afterward, using Hong Kong as a shareholders and then set up their company in Greater Bay Area or, 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 or for, for mostly in Shenzhen. And then um, 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 like, 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 like my company, uh, our robot company, we do similar stuff. And also when a company in Hong Kong is a startup, I, I, I find out that there's lots of support organization like Cyberport or Science Park. They really support those company in Hong Kong to bring the stuff from Shenzhen to outside. So take a step start in Hong Kong is a, is a good start. Thank you for that. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, we could wrap up with, uh, uh, with a, a question or two. Um, one of the, the, uh, the questions I, uh, is, is uh, at least uh, the, that I've, I've been asked is, is um, uh, as, as all of you have been hearing about the, the trade war that's been going on um, uh, uh, with, with China, how do startups uh, sort of navigate um, uh, through this, this, uh, this myriad of, of, of uh, conflict that's going on um, in terms of, of trying to raise uh, capital or, or to, to get manufacturing done uh, just from all different perspectives. Uh, do any, any of our panelists here have an opinion on, on what's, what's the best way to navigate through this? I think maybe I'll start. Um, I, I think, you know, from, from our perspective at Brink, we, we invest in companies all throughout the world. The, the reality is uh, it, it's a challenge globally, right? So if, if you are a startup that you're looking for funding from that perspective, I think what's important is that you need to clearly articulate your value proposition. You just need to make sure that when you do get the right audience, you make the best of it. I know that it's quite broad, but the reality is, is that everyone is taking a more enhanced look at any potential opportunities and they are being more cautious in terms of uh, any of those investments that they want to make. In terms of the manufacturing and supply chain side, I think similarly, you, you should make sure that if you're going to invest in working with strategic partners, you want to do your due diligence on them. Make sure that they're the right partner for you. Make sure that you understand the terms of your contract and, and really be careful about making sure that you don't kick off uh, on something that you might not need to initially. That there might be ways that you could uh, create initial features and launch a product or an MVP to get to market, start creating revenue. And there's always features you can add over time. So for me, I think in general, it's just uh, about being smart about the global market dynamics and, and the way that you're positioning your business, both short and long-term. I think that's all the time that we have for, uh, so I'll, I'll turn it back to, uh, to Rachel. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks, Derek and the panelists for that very practical um, session. Uh, in the interest of time, I'd uh, like to uh, invite Rachel Chan to provide us a quick overview of the Adventures GBA program and moderate the Q&A session. Over to you, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, you're on mute. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Chen. I'm the co-founder of Esperanza. Uh, before we open the Q&A session, just a very quick word on what this Adventure GBA Fellowship is about, because some of you may be new to this program. Uh, if we can start the slide. Yes, next one. Next one, please. Next one. Yes. Uh, one of the benefits, uh, go back, yes, uh, the benefits of this program, we are here to help EdTech setup that are ready to expand internationally, to meet potential investors, get advice from market entry professionals, uh, identify localization partners, uh, work with education and corporate clients, and also get global media exposure. Uh, today, we have our co-creator, Cyberport. They also have a very valuable entrepreneurship support program uh, to help all startups that are interested in using the Hong Kong platform to scale their global business. Uh, next one. Next one. Yes, this is our program. Um, typical of all startups, we have to pivot because of the global health situation. Uh, the Active Fellowship Program is now a blended program of online as well as this offline trip to the GBA, hopefully next year, when uh, the pandemic situation kind of get away from us. So what are you going to do in the next few months? Um, we are going to uh, close the application on the 24th of August, and then we will have a vetting panel of with experts selecting 12 finalists. And for these 12 finalists, uh, we will arrange for them to showcase their work in a virtual expo for one month. And then on the 4th of November at Cyberport's, uh, Cyberport Venture Capital Forum on the 4th, uh, we will give the platform for these 12 finalists to do virtual pitching to our distinguished panel of judges and also all the other participants of this forum, comprising investors, uh, educators, corporate clients, and other business professionals who may be interested in finding new business opportunities. And then after this pitch event, we will also arrange for the uh, winners of this program to do different sorts of virtual presentations, business matching activities, and get market entry advice. And as I mentioned, next year, on the next slide, uh, hopefully we can invite all these 12 finalists to do a physical visit to Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Dongguan uh, to really experience firsthand what the opportunities are. And the trip will also be a good opportunity for you to meet face to face with those people that probably you will have established contacts through all sorts of different virtual platforms. Next one. So uh, that's all I have to say very quickly on this uh, GBA fellowship program. Now uh, let us start our Q&A session. Um, we have received some questions before. And one of the questions, uh, Catherine Zhang from PWC, are you here? Uh, we have a taxation question. Um, maybe Catherine or some other panelists, you can also answer this. Uh, is the test incentive that we mentioned uh, applicable only to uh, certain type of companies or Will the tax incentive be relevant to all companies that will be setting up in the GBA area? Okay. Um. Actually, uh, Rachel, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um. So it is a good question. So um, 
talking about the incentive, uh, tax incentives, I think there are two um, major types of incentives. One is for the individual's income tax, uh, which is uh, provided to those expatriates um, working in the Guangdong province areas. Uh, the other is we call it the income tax, uh, the corporate income tax, the reductions of the corporate income tax rate. So uh, for the uh, individual's income tax, um, because this is a uh, um, municipal uh, policies, so any um, you know companies um, they send their employees, but of course um, there are certain uh, criteria uh, first whether you have some uh, qualifications and uh, also whether it is a shortage of the supply in the uh, Guangdong province areas. So if um, certain criteria are uh, fulfilled, it, those individuals, they are working in the GBA area or in the Guangdong province, they will be um, entitled for the uh, individual's income tax incentives. For the corporate income tax incentives, normally uh, it will um, be uh, offered to those uh, companies providing we call it qualified services or qualified uh, business activities. So not all the you know corporations will be entitled for the uh, for the uh, corporate income tax incentives. But from I, I would say for most of the the companies with technology you know um, stuff or um, are focusing on the technology uh, uh, business activities, they are normally will be uh, qualified for that kind of the uh, corporate uh, income tax uh, incentives. Thank you. Um, I got a question actually for Kevin or maybe some other panelists as well. Um, is GBA only good for supply chain management in China or in GBA or actually can be a much bigger catchment area in terms of the supply chain? Really good question. So I, I think, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, there are other regions in the world that you can also you know, get great supply chain solutions in. I, I think that, you know, the, the GBA is uniquely positioned to have an, an integrated solution. And, and I think, you know, compared to potentially some of the different regions throughout North America and Europe, there's financial incentives as well. And, and for me, I think what a lot of people might not be aware of is that for, for sure within the region, there's a lot of manufacturing capabilities but I think also what you've seen through LKK, through SVV, there, there's that early stage design development and creative resources as well. So, so even for a founder or a team that's looking for early stage development, you could actually start doing that work within the region all the way through scaled production. So I think that's, that's one of the unique uh, changes and dynamics that I've seen here in the region as well. Um, other panelists, anything to supplement? Uh, if not, I got another question here. Uh, what kind of schools actually will be interested in piloting some of the ag tech solutions? Maybe Ming or Joe, you have any insights? When you say piloting, what does it mean by piloting? Uh, say if a startup has a new ag tech solution from Europe, US, or any parts of the world. They want to go to the GBA area as a new mm -hmm. market. What kind of schools will be more receptive to testing out new solutions? There's, a, uh, there's some of the policy restriction for public school. They are not allowed to have any education app uh, with the register to, to be used in China. So uh, the only way you can pilot it is only you can do it with some private uh, institution, um, even some of the so-called private school, uh, uh, which is not allowed under the policy. So if you really target it to the public ed uh, public education system or mainstream uh, curriculum, I think that will be extremely hard. Uh, in case of those of the private uh, tutoring or the private education services, I think, uh, yes, you can start the pilot, but Again, the pilot is not easy to be honest because you need to first establish your group of the user uh, in this area and where you create, you need to start with the, some of the like in WeChat, you have uh, create groups that you can have a group of the uh, people who is interested in your product, your design. So the best way to start with nowadays in China is you can use like 
uh, TikTok, and then you demonstrate some of your product, how it works, and then draw some attention, get some likes, and then start to build your own uh, uh, groups. Then you can start with the uh, rival to spread this. I think that would be the best and easiest way. Uh, here, I think I have a question for Ming. Um, obviously, we've been talking about the need for localization and finding a right partner is a key to this. So Ming, any advice, how can, you know, um, Act tech business from outside this region, uh, how can they find the right partner? Uh, what well, are the con key considerations? Yeah, well, I think that uh, first of all, the integrity is very important and then the trust. So if you want, uh, if you want to make sure that uh, uh, your act tech be successful, then you have to understand what what uh, what is your uh, market? What what I mean is, okay, are you going to sell your solutions to school directly, or are you going to sell it to parents? They are all different. So if you are if you want to sell to schools, right? That's just what Joe already mentioned. In China, actually, the schools are un, uh, almost majority of them are the public schools and uh, funded by the government and also controlled by the government. So. Um, it wouldn't be too easy to uh, uh, unless you find a uh, a partner who already established a uh, um, uh, sales channels to the government schools. However, uh, if you are talking about in Hong Kong, right? Uh, in fact, uh, well, Hong Kong is very open. Well, I think that your act act is well perceived by schools or by parents. Basically, you can. Uh, well, you can use Hong Kong as your test back to see whether uh, you know you have opportunities in developing your ag tech industries uh, in Hong Kong before you move it to China. Because, well, Hong Kong is a good place that for you to demonstrate your success of your ag tech. At the same time, you can identify the right partner in the Greater Bay Area. Okay, so um, um, this is important for you to learn some the, uh, the market in Hong Kong as well as um, takes time to identify um, your right partner in terms of first of all the integrity and the trust and the ability whether um, they share the same mission with you and that is important. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question which is also a very good question. What are the hot trends in the ag tech space in this region? Panelists, what are the really services offering that are in great demand coming up? So, so I can speak from it in an investor perspective. A, a few areas that we've seen that are, are pretty hot is, is looking at integrating ed tech and immersive experiences. So I, I did see a few notes here. So integration of AR and VR and, and trying to captivate the audience in a better way. Uh, likewise, I, I think personalized education and companies that are trying to uh, make it more efficient in terms of the way that they're educating uh, students. Uh, I think those are two trends that, that I've certainly seen uh, emerging. Yeah, thank you. Uh, how about other panelists? Any ideas, suggestions? I think uh, from what I see in, in China, in Shenzhen, the uh, uh, coding education for children uh, I mean, the providing tools, uh, not directly for, for children, but for for uh, for education uh, schools, is is a uh, is a uh, pretty uh, pretty hard late lately, and uh, there are several already already growing uh, quite well, and also the there be uh, online and offline uh, education tools, but the the doctors more more of a more of a providing content, and the uh, and uh, since uh, uh, the education in China is primarily uh, in uh, in in Chinese, but the, if, uh, if uh, international teams want to come, want to join in, uh, English program might be also interesting. And the, uh, in most of the, uh, the, the private education uh, organization, the English uh, education is pretty uh, expensive, which means uh, there are enough profit room for international uh, side company to, to join in. But the, uh, unfortunately, uh, you may have to be local here. I mean, uh, set up uh, your local operation in, in China. Yeah, so 
uh, again, is the question of uh, finding good local partner also very important. Um, I think we have to conclude this webinar. I know that you know you will still probably have some other questions. Um, I'm sure our panelists will be happy to stay in touch uh, with all of you. If our panelists don't mind sharing your contact email details, you can share through the chat box uh, so that you know some of our entrants can continue to get some advice from you. And now uh, we would like to conclude this session. But before that, uh, can we share, you know, we have a short survey to get some feedback from you and also like to know more how our program can help and support you. If you can take one minute uh, to do this feedback form for us. Uh, you can either scan the QR code or uh, our colleague has sent in a link via the chat box. You can do the survey there as well. And last but not least, the last slide, which is very important. Stay in touch with us. Um, we have a linking group uh, for both Esperanza and for Cyberport. Um, especially if you want the latest news on the fellowship, uh, join this Esperanza linking page. And even if you're not an ag tech seller, if you want to get involved in the ag tech business as a potential investor, potential partner, looking for opportunities, also join this group because as John said, we are forming a community of people interested in ag tech. And we will also post uh, a summary of the event today there and answer, try to answer some of the questions. For example, there's a good question on whether there's any useful resource on education policy in China. We will post the information there. Uh, we don't have time to answer this in detail today. So um, that's all I have. I stay in touch via our virtual platform and hope to see all of you very soon. Uh, the upcoming exciting event, the Cyberport Venture Capital Forum. Thank you. Uh, let's all pose for our group photo as our final group photo for all our panelists and speakers. Thank you all, thank you. And let's stay in touch. Uh, we should, you know, open the chat room for a few more minutes in case, you know, uh, our panelists would like to leave your contact details. And if there are any questions that you can give an instant written reply, uh, you can also do so. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Have a good one.